Hey, greetings everyone. Lieutenant Colonel Alan West here and welcome to the Steadfast and Loyal Podcast. You gotta light them up before they burn it down. Better dig deep and put them in the ground. Blood on their hands, they're hell bound. Save us all. Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to the Steadfast and Loyal Podcast. There's a lot happening in our country right now, and a lot is happening up there on Capitol Hill. So what I wanted to do was to get the insight and perspective of a good, strong, constitutional conservative member of our Congress, and that's Congressman Tom Tiffany, who represents the 7th Congressional District of Wisconsin. Representative Tiffany was elected in May of 2020 in a special election for that seat. Prior to his election to Congress, Representative Tiffany served in the Wisconsin State Assembly and State Senate for the 12th District. He was a member of the Joint Finance Committee which is responsible for the state's budget and served as chairman of the Senate Committee on Sporting, Heritage, Mining, and Forestry. During his time in the state legislature, Representative Tiffany worked to cut taxes, increase job creation, and protect Second Amendment rights. Representative Tiffany has deep roots in the 7th District. He grew up on a dairy farm near Elmwood, Wisconsin, and graduated from the University of Wisconsin River Falls with a degree in agricultural economics. Representative Tiffany is honored to represent the people of northern and western Wisconsin by restoring freedom to create a more prosperous America. Representative Tiffany, welcome to the Steadfast and Law Podcast. Alan, it's really good to be with you here today. And by the way, if anybody can put a uh, thumbtack on Elmwood, Wisconsin, we're going to give them extra credit today. What do you say? say it's just so. a little burg of a, a little burg of about 800 people. Uh, wow. I grew up in small town America. I've always lived in small towns, and there's no better place to be, I believe, in America. I can agree with you. And lots of times we need some of those small town values and principles to go to the larger cities because, as you know, that's where we see the greatest amount of failures of the policies of the progressive socialist left. So let's start out by talking about what's going on politically in Wisconsin. You know, we just had the, uh, the Supreme Court race there. A lot of money was dumped in Wisconsin. How do you see the future for Wisconsin? Because a lot of people realize it's one of those key swing states. Yeah, it's really a great question. So at this point, uh, you know, uh, I came in the same year Scott Walker did. When Scott mm -hmm. Walker was elected governor in 2010, that's when I came in to the state legislature. And we had eight years of great reforms in Wisconsin, put Wisconsin in so much better position. In fact, I would mention one of you that you mentioned in my bio. I was on the finance committee. We did everything in regards to the budget. The reason I ran in 2010, Alan, for the state legislatures, we had a $3 billion deficit. Mm. And I just found it unconscionable. And we took the time methodically over the ensuing decade to get Wisconsin's finances back in order. And it is in good shape now, even yet. So really um, in a good spot in that way. Now the state legislature has been holding the line since 2018 because of um, uh, with the election of Governor Evers, a Democrat who wants to spend more and do all kinds of the crazy things that the progressive left wants to do. It is a real moment of concern for us in Wisconsin, though, because as a result of the Supreme Court race, there will now be four liberals, I would say basically progressives that um, in a seven member court mm -hmm. that are going to hold court now after August 1st when the newest member is sworn in and they could do all kinds of stuff. We don't know what they're going to do. And um, but you can bet after the coastal elites putting in, what was it? 
$75 million into that race? It was a boatload of millions of dollars. It was incredible. They are going to want something for that. And so you're going to see the cases come up from the lower courts now. I could see them dealing, I could see abortion, um, going to abortion on demand with this court. I could see them um, striking down the maps that actually Governor Evers approved, like in, in terms of us congressional members. I could see him striking down the maps. I could see them doing all kinds of stuff um, that uh, the transgender stuff. I mean, you could see, I would just urge people, take a look at what's going on in Minnesota now where they've went left of California with Democrats completely taking over their state. You could see something similar in Wisconsin if this court does some of the things that they've talked about. And, and that's amazing because really what the left believes in, and I call it the three branches of rule, not the three branches of government, they believe in controlling the media, academia, and the courts. And uh, you see how they are just apoplectic about losing the United States Supreme Court. But when they can, can control courts, especially at the state level, they will rule by judicial activism. And I think that that's what you're warning us about there in Wisconsin. Yeah, you said it very well, Alan. That's exactly what um, uh, Wisconsinites should be concerned about. And I would actually say, Alan, we should be concerned about that as a country. Because in order to win the presidency in 2024, we need to win Wisconsin. Yes. And uh, that's one of the things that we could see from an activist court, right? Mm -hmm. We have a photo ID law that I voted for back when I was in the state legislature 10 years ago, common sense proposal. More people have been voting even in light of photo ID. Uh, you know, the left always claims that it's going, there's going to be voter suppression. Not the case at all. But you could see them striking down photo ID. I could see them doing things that would expand uh, voting beyond what it is already. Um, I mean, I could see them giving driver's licenses to people who are here illegally. I mean, you just never know what they're going to do. But this should concern everybody around the country because we need Wisconsin in order to win the presidency. You know, hopefully people understand civics and realize that a court cannot make law. They're supposed to interpret the law, but it's up to a legislative branch to, to, to actually pass legislation bills and, and to make law. Uh, you brought up a great point talking about fiscal sanity, how you came into uh, the office there, state representative, and you had a huge billion dollar, three billion dollar deficit in Wisconsin, and you corrected, corrected that. I am glad that you voted no on that fiscal responsibility uh, bill because to me, it was not fiscally responsible, it was oxymoronic. Tell us what really were the contributing factors, because there's a lot of noise out there. Well, what was it that compelled you to vote no against the Fiscally uh, Responsibility Act? Yeah, so if you go back about five, six weeks when we passed the original bill yes. out of the House of Representatives, in exchange for President Biden getting an increase in the federal credit card of a trillion and a half dollars, we got a bunch of things that had some fiscal responsibility in there, and but also some pro-growth things mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, the permitting reform was in there, mm -hmm. work requirements. We had some really good stuff in there that not only got us some fiscal responsibility, but it also got us some uh, pro-growth uh, provisions in there. Most of that, as it was negotiated with the president, went away. And more alarmingly to me, we went from a trillion and a half dollars to four trillion dollars over the next year and a half. And all I could think back was when I campaigned in 2010 for the state legislature, I found three billion dollar deficit to be unconscionable to spend another four trillion dollars to take us to thirty six trillion dollars. I just couldn't get there, Alan, and so I just thought the best vote was no, and um, in light of what we've seen that the bill does, I believe it was a correct vote. No, it's absolutely right as a correct vote, and, you know, help our listeners and, and the audience to understand, because there's a, such a thing as regular order. So if you pass a bill in the House of Representatives who has the power of the purse, all matters of fiscal uh, issues have to come through the House uh, first and, and, and last, why is it that you pass a bill and then you think you have to go and negotiate it? Uh, 
the, the duty is upon the Senate now to, to pass a, a bill. And then you go into a conference committee to reconcile that bill. You don't sit down behind closed doors with a select committee or people out of the speaker's office and all of a sudden, now we're going to negotiate the thing. Well, you're negotiating with yourself because you already did what the Constitution says. You passed a bill that with a Republican majority, you guys got it done. And now we see what ended up passing was really with Democrats, uh, you know, outvoting Republicans in the Republican held uh, House of Representatives. Can we get back to being able to institute the regular order, especially when we see we've got 12 appropriations bills coming up that have to be passed by the end of September as we go forward? How can we leverage that as we go forward? Boy, I think you just did a great job of describing what happened from that period of time when we voted our bill out of the House and then there was this negotiation going on with the president. I mean, uh, we should have done what you said is we're not sending this bill to the president. Yeah. We're sending it to the Senate. And then uh, Chuck Schumer. Um, I believe Speaker McCarthy should, who, who did a really good job the first five months. I just have some disagreement with this last bill, mm -hmm. uh, the debt limit bill. He should have said, Senator Schumer, the ball's now in your court. Send a bill back to us. And every time a re <laughs> and every time a reporter asked him, so what does President Biden think? Whatever he should have just said, it doesn't matter what President Biden Absolutely. says. President Biden should go lobby Senator Schumer if he has anything to say. We've passed a bill. It's responsible. It gives additional room in the federal credit card while getting some pro-growth policies. And we were winning that debate. Yes. And I think you, uh, he should have been very consistent, the speaker should have been, in saying to, it's in Senator Schumer's lap now. He needs to pass a bill in the Senate, send it back to us, and then we'll decide. Or better yet, just pass our bill and send it to the president because we did uh, produce a good bill. Mm -hmm. So having said all that, we're going to get another kick at the cat here with the appropriations process. And as you've alluded to, it's been a long time, over a decade, since a bill went through in what we call regular order, yes. where all 12 appropriations bills are um are negotiated in committee, and then they come together as the budget bill in the House of Representatives. We're hopeful that we're going to do that and that we get some fiscal responsibility within that appropriations process. Hopefully that's going to happen over the next couple of months so we don't do another one of these omnibus bills. Yes. We don't do another continuing resolution, those type of things. Hopefully we can do a legitimate budget, show the American people that it is possible to do it because it's a big part of the breakdown, right? It is. Nancy Pelosi used to send us bills, say we had a thousand page bill, four trillion dollars, whatever. And she'd say, hey, you guys got two hours to read this. That in large part is the breakdown of what has happened here in the Congress of the United States. We need to get back to regular order. You know, a, a lot of people are really upset with, and let's be honest, the politicization, the weaponization of these government agencies. Uh, right now, the first ones you can think of is the Department of Justice and the FBI. Even over in the Department of Defense, you've got all of these DEI programs, which does nothing for our national security and our military readiness. Can we look at these things that are going on and say, we're not going to fund it? That, anything that is ideologically based, we're not going to fund that. We're going to stick to the things that are constitutional and what the American taxpayers believe we should be funding. Is, is that a good, strong premise to stand on as you go into the appropriations process? Yeah, you know, Alan, based on what you said there, I swear you were at our Freedom Caucus meeting last night because it's exactly what we <laughs> talked about yeah. is that let's have these bills, the appropriations bills, go through regular order and then let's call out the stuff that really is non-fiscal, that is setting a direction of our country like the DEI stuff, the woke stuff and get it out of our institutions in the federal government. That's one of the things that we should be doing here as we go forward. And 
Um, it's actually a real opportunity here, and I hope we will stand firm, we'll stand strong, because, you know, really, whether you're a moderate Republican or a conservative Republican, I think most people um, agree that, you know, our kids shouldn't, I mean, uh, they should not be getting transgender surgery without their parents knowing about yes. it. Um, the woke stuff that kids are being taught that America is a bad place, you know, there's no place for that. And trying to um, entrench that into our military, as you are very familiar with, is just toxic mm -hmm. because you have to do everything you can to get those people in our military to work together. You need a cohesive fighting force, right? That's correct. And this stuff serves to divide Americans. It should have no place in our federal government and especially in our military. And, and that's why you see that the readiness, the recruiting, the retention levels of our military at a, at a very disturbing low right now. And, and, and along that line, let's talk about the ATF, Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, Explosives. You know, they came out with a rule back in January about this little piece of plastic thing called a pistol brace. And of course, now all of a sudden, uh, you know, tens of millions of Americans, that's what the Congressional Research Service has, has estimated that, tens of millions of Americans now are all of a sudden felons because of a rule that came from an unelected bureaucratic agency. Talk about one that you can look at taking some funding away from. H.J. Resolution 44 should be coming up for a vote this week. How do you stand on H.J. Resolution 44, which asserts that it's the Congress that makes, you know, bills and laws and things of this nature, not, not the ATF criminalizing Americans for doing nothing wrong? Uh, how will you vote on H.J. Res 44? Well, I've already had a chance to vote in the Judiciary Committee, and I voted for that resolution right. for the reasons that you stated. It is the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms um, exceeding their authority, um, uh, s stepping on Congress's authority, and I hope that this will pass through the full House, and I think it'll have a real chance to get through the Senate also, and let's send it on to President Biden, see what he's going to do with it. Remember the genesis of the pistol brazen. Mm -hmm. This was developed by a veteran, yes. and for veterans that are disabled or have some disability that makes it more difficult for them to shoot a firearm, and they still want to participate, whether it's out on the shooting range mm -hmm. or perhaps they're hunting, whatever. It allows them to be able to do that yet. And here, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms 10 years ago said, this is a legal, um, this is a legal addition to a weapon. And we have said that it should be allowed. And now they all of a sudden reverse course. And it's clearly overreached by the bureaucrats. We need to set them in their place in regards to this because it is a legal addition to a firearm. Yeah, it's just an accessory. I mean, I, I, and I don't understand. I always say that it would be just like going to a woman and saying, you cannot buy this uh, pearl necklace to accessorize this dress. We're going to make the, you into a, uh, into a felon. And I also believe that, you know, as we get ready to go in 2024, they would love to see 10 to 20 million legal law-abiding Americans become felons because then you can't vote. Uh, so that's, I think, an underlying reason. Let's talk about a couple of things specifically that you have introduced. We have big concerns with the United Nations and especially with the World Health Organization. You have uh, introduced legislation that makes sure that we retain our American sovereignty, especially as it pertains to the World Health Organization. Can you talk to us about that legislation that you have introduced that you are sponsoring? Yeah, real simple piece of legislation that I introduced with Senator Johnson from Wisconsin, who, you know, there was no one, no one in the Congress of the United States that was better in exposing the COVID cartel than Senator Johnson. Mm -hmm. And so what we're saying in our bill is that the um, federal government, in order to enter into any agreement with the World Health Organization, they must take this to a treaty. Uh, or to a vote as a treaty, um, because that requires a two-thirds vote of the United States Senate to enter into a treaty. Because in effect, that's what we would be doing. Yeah. This agreement that we would strike in regards to pandemic responses, um, it would be an agreement amongst multiple countries, very much like a treaty, 
It's like a treaty. Let's treat it like a treaty. And it would require a two thirds vote. I think it just makes sense to do that, especially in light of the actions of the World Health Organization, which has proven themselves to just be an appendage of the Chinese Communist Party. Yes, yeah, spot on. And the other thing, and we'll close out on this before I give you a, a final word. You, you were born, raised up there on a dairy farm. And, you know, as a kid, I, I remember drinking chocolate milk. I love chocolate milk even to today. You have people that are out there advertising chocolate milk as a, as a great uh, nutritious drink. Why is it that these idiots up there in the Biden administration want to take chocolate milk away from kids? I, I know that this is something that's got your dander up and you're fighting back against that. You know, they're trying to tell us what kind of dishwasher we have in our home, what, what kind of stove we have in our home. Now they're trying to take chocolate milk away from the kids while they tell the kids they can go out and get their bodies mutilated. I don't get it. Maybe you can help me understand. Well, think about how that would raise the ire of someone who represents America's dairy land, mm -hmm. Wisconsin, and they want to introduce or they want to eliminate uh, chocolate milk. It's wants actually. I think Alan that this really highlights how extreme this administration is. It, you know, when you have all these issues that are percolating, whether it's the border, energy independence, inflation, I mean, you've got these huge issues, crime that are going on across America, the high cost of health care, all these big issues. And they're saying, well, we got to regulate chocolate milk of our kids in schools. And to me, it harks back to the Obama administration, which, of course, this president uh, was an integral player in when Michelle Obama said, you know, we got to dictate to our schools what they're going to have in their school lunch programs. This is a, another part of that movement. We have to dictate to people at every uh, point in their life, in their daily lives, of how they're going to lead their life. And I remember when Michelle Obama introduced that over a decade ago. And I had school lunch professionals that came to me. Now, this was still when I was in the state legislature. They came to me and they said, what in the world is going on? Because with the requirements they're putting in place, I'll guarantee you one thing. We're going to throw a whole lot more food in the garbage can. Yeah. We know how to make nutritious meals for these kids. Just leave us alone. And what they found is that uh, when they inter, uh, introduced uh, those standards over a decade ago, is that a lot of kids left the school lunch, uh, left the school lunchroom, and they were not um, their 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 hunger was not satisfied, and it was the worst thing that could happen because then they're searching for more food to eat, and oftentimes they would eat poor, um, uh, less nutritious foods. Yeah. And so anyhow, it was a real problem then, and it's a real problem now that the Obama, or excuse me, the Biden administration is sticking their nose once again in the school lunch program that these school lunch managers know much better of what they should be putting on those kids' plates. Well, you know, it's consistent with the fact that we have heard Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, and Corrine Jean-Pierre, the White House spokesperson, all say that our kids are not our kids, that they belong to them. Uh, and, and their desire to control our kids from, you know, determining who is, is born uh, because they seem to not even like our unborn kids, this radical uh, murdering of unborn babies up to the time of birth and even afterwards, now they want to mutilate their bodies, now they want to talk about what they can have to eat or to drink. To me, it's just reflective of a controlling Marxist ideology. So I will let you close out. What are the things that you're prioritizing now till the end of this fiscal year, 30 September? And how can people follow you? How can people support you and keep up with the work that Representative Tom Tiffany is doing for the 7th Congressional District in Wisconsin? Yeah, anytime you want to look me up at Rep Tiffany. And by the way, I believe I have one of the best weekly newsletters that uh, comes out of Congress. It's called the Tiffany Telegram every Friday. You can sign up for it. It doesn't cost anything. Gets in your email inbox every Friday. Uh, we tell people, uh, we share with people what we're doing in Washington, D.C. and in the district. I think people would really enjoy it. I would urge them to sign up. But once again, at Rep Tiffany. And um, I would say there's two things. One, in regards to the natural resource 
Resources Committee, we got to get back to energy independence. Yeah. We got to be able to utilize our natural resources, which we have a, such abundance in America, and we do it the best in terms of protecting our environment of any country in the world. We need to be able to do that to have prosperity. And the second thing is, I really look forward to my work along with Chairman Jim Jordan in the Judiciary Committee as we hold the FBI and our intelligence agencies accountable for what they have been doing. We have so much work to be done in that regard, regards, Alan, to protect the Constitution, in particular, the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, and being able to protect people's constitutional rights here in America. As you know better than anyone, they're under threat. We have to save America, and saving America starts by saving the Constitution. Well, Representative Tom, Tiffany, I want to thank you so very much for joining us on the Steadfast in Law podcast, and I hope that you will come back again. And Godspeed, God's blessings, and keep up the great work that you're doing there in representing all of us, but especially the people, your constituents in the 7th Congressional District in Wisconsin. Really enjoyed joining you today, Alan, and keep up the good work. All right. You tell everybody else up there, keep up the fire, okay? Will do. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for joining us on this episode of the Steadfast and Loyal Podcast. Thank you, Representative Tom Tiffany of 7th Congressional District in Wisconsin for taking time out of an incredibly busy schedule to spend some time sharing thoughts and perspectives and principles and legislation with us. As always, if you like this podcast, please click the like button and share it with others. Till next time, step fast and more. Before they burn it down.